Peter started working in the late 1950s, um, although he you know, studied painting here in the U.S. Um, in St. Louis, like he quickly moved to Europe. Um, and so, you know, Peter really struck upon his own um, style of pop art that he developed kind of independently from um, the pop art that was developing in places like London and New York. So so he, um, while he was living in London or Paris or Rome, um, he would look back to the United States, um, you know, through the pages of magazines. So he was looking at advertisements in Life magazine. He was looking at, you know, Mad magazine, kind of creating his own depiction about what American um, cultural life was like from abroad. So um, so while, you know, Peter was developing these kinds of paintings where he would take, you know, images um, of consumer products um, in his own kind of warped, surreal sort of style, um, you know, American artists like Andy Warhol, Roy Lichtenstein were, you know, hitting upon their own vision about what, um, you know, what pop art, how pop art could channel American culture, um, you know, with Peter having no knowledge of that happening whatsoever. So, you know, eventually he found out that pop art was happening and he was kind of disappointed because he really thought he had struck on something completely original at the time. Uh, but, you know, I think over time he's started to become acknowledged um, as a kind of pioneer of, of a kind of hand painted pop, as it would come to be called, um, you know, and, you know, his work is now kind of, I think, rightly put alongside these other kind of early pop art pioneers as, as some of the most important work that was being made in the late 1950s, early 1960s. You know, he, Peter's been using his work as a way to kind of uh, critique America, um, you know, American political and social life. Um, you know, for multiple decades, um, and the kind of irreverence that he's brought to these kind of, you know, um, these sort of tough issues has really kind of made him inspiring for younger artists to look at right at this moment. Here's icebox number nine. This is a little more formal looking. It's got a rather large toilet in it, though, right in the middle. Why did I put the toilet there anyway? I think with the idea initially at this stage of my life, which I was very young, of course, is to insult the uh, respectability respectability of modern art. It, it was already a church-like affair with people going into museums and staring silently at large expanses of nothing, in my opinion. So I, I definitely wanted to insult that idea. He was really trying to kind of, you know, as he said, kind of thumb his nose at at kind of um, acceptable kinds of painting, which meant abstraction. Um, you know, because of that, he really didn't, um, you know, didn't really model his work on any specific artist. He was really taking, you know, borrowing from American vernacular culture, borrowing from kind of unacceptable forms of inspiration, like, you know, advertisements, um, like comic books. So in early you know, works, you see Superman, um, Mickey Mouse appearing in his work. Um, and then also even more kind of like unacceptable inspiration, like, um, you know, crime comics, like pulp novels, um, the really kind of lowest forms about what American culture could be and trying to bring it into the kind of accepted forms of, um, you know, of, of fine art, um, you know, um, in a way to kind of upend what um, what could really enter museums and galleries as kind of um, as a definition about what American culture could and should be at that moment in the 1950s, 1960s. Crime Doesn't Pay is one of a number of the kind of execution um, electric bear paintings that Peter started making in 1963, which coincidentally was the same year that Andy Warhol first depicted the electric chair in his own work. So um, for Peter, you know, it became, um, you know, one of his most popular subjects that he would return to over the years. And, you know, for him, it also kind of represented the kind of um, entertainment that he thought that America as a whole found in um, stories and depictions of um, crime and punishment. So hence where the exhibition gets its title. Um, you know, for Peter, you know, America is at its heart a, a kind of a, a sadistic and a punitive um, country by nature. Um, and, you know, he looked at things like, um, like crime comics, like, um, uh, you know, the stories in the press, like even that he remembers from his childhood, um, you know, the stories of murderers and um, and their victims and the kind of like, you know, the kind of public spectacle of executions as being, you know, um, somehow inherent to the American psyche. So um, so the electric chair for him, you know, really is a kind of representation of this kind of idea of Americans lust for um, lust for lust for violence and lust for, um, I, you know, um, imagery around punishment. Here we have Ethel Rosenberg in the electric chair. This actually is based on fact. After World War II, the United States had atomic weapons and it was the only country to have it. And all of a sudden it looked like the Russians were going to get it too. And the feeling in America at this time, 
among people like, you know, my parents, ordinary people, is that the Russians were too stupid to think of the bomb by themselves. Someone had to give them the secrets. So Ethel and Julius Rosenberg were convicted of giving the secrets to uh, Russia. Consequently, they were sentenced to death. And this is the unusual part. I remember this from about 1950, 51 in there, before there was television widespread. Their execution was broadcast on radio. This is the only time I've ever heard of an execution broadcast on radio in, in the United States. And I remember listening with my parents. And the guy said, the announcer said, um, well, they've just unstrapped Julius's body. They're taking it out. Uh, they're bringing in Ethel now. Ethel is being strapped in. And they went through all the motions of this, you know. Ethel is being consoled by her pastor or something, you know what I mean? That kind of thing. And okay, I'm looking to the left. I think the switch is about to be thrown. Uh, the switch is thrown. The switch is thrown. Ethel Rosenberg is electrocuted. And then he said, oh my God, her hair is on fire. Her hair is on fire. And the announcer became completely unhinged. He didn't know what to say next. Uh, who would, you know? burning like a candle. So anyway, my mother at that point said, turn it off. So I never found out what happened next, but in 1987, I painted the picture. He returned to live in the Bay Area where he had grown up. Um, and of course, you know, at, at that moment in the mid 19 to late 1960s, um, the kind of resistance to the Vietnam War um, through, um, you know, public protest, through the kind of peace movement. You know, Peter was himself very much opposed to the war. Um, he participated in peace demonstrations. But what he really found, though, was that, you know, um, although many artists were part of these kinds of anti-war movements, you know, their work weren't really reflecting um, an opposition to the war in its content and in, in the imagery that it was that was being produced. Um, so he took his own kind of, you know, this kind of cartoon surreal style of figuration that he developed over the past several years and turned it to, in his mind, depicting the absolute horror of what the Vietnam War was and was about. You know, over time, um, as more um, reporting the press came out um, that showed exactly how horrific the conflict actually was, you know, some of these things that have been in his imagination, you know, were proving to be even more, um, you know, um, actually tamer than what was actually happening in real life. And that's when he actually stopped doing the series was, was when he realized that actually, you know, the tide was turning towards public sentiment against the war because people realized how horrible the war had become. I wanted political art that I could make to be way, way too far, not to be in the middle. Um, my honest feeling about politics in art is that it's usually feeble because it delivers the expected message. If, if a picture is not troubling, why even think about it? So following um, his Vietnam series, Peter kind of turned his attention to um, the kind of um, the kind of chaos and upheaval that he felt um, in the Bay Area more broadly. He did a series of paintings about um, uh, both the government of California, um, who at the time, you know, the governor was Ronald Reagan um, uh, and, you know, uh, whose kind of conservative uh, politics Peter opposed, um, you know, very broadly. Um, but just in, in general, he, you know, he saw San Francisco and, and saw the Bay Area as a kind of like. Um, uh, a kind of microcosm for the national um, uh, crisis that people were experiencing. Um, and so, you know, View of San Francisco is maybe one of the more tamer works in terms of subject matter that Peter produced, but it would also kind of, I think, represents the way that he was trying to kind of, um, you know, channel a kind of social and political message into kind of a, a, a really kind of formal um, uh, painterly form. About 1985, it occurred to me there was a coincidence between the San Francisco earthquake, which is quite famous, and the abstract expressionist art, which is also similar. You know, things suddenly happen. Whoops, there goes the red. Whoops, there goes the blue. Who knows what's going to happen next? Well, if the city, if that were to happen to San Francisco, you wouldn't know what was going to happen next. So things would go wrong. In this painting, things go very wrong. Uh, buildings reproduce multiply, drop into the ocean, and so on and so on. I painted at least three of these big paintings of San Francisco. It's a favorite subject of mine. As much as he's felt kind of an outsider to kind of, let's say, the New York critical art establishment, 
you know, he really has always helped held a deep kind of um, respect for painting throughout history. And he has, you know, his favorite painters that he's returned to over the years. Um, but in the mid 1970s, he started looking at specific paintings and doing his own kind of Peter Saul versions of them. This was inspired, by the way, Custer's Last Stand was inspired by a, a visit to the Buffalo Bill Museum, which I, I forget where it is. It's near Reno, I think. There was a painting there of Custer's Last Stand by an artist who'd done an enormous amount of research into where everything actually was. And the painting was so boring that that's actually what gave me the idea of just making it up. I suddenly realized the history painting itself is better off if, if you don't know anything, if the artist doesn't know anything. The more the artist knows, the deader it is. At a certain point, several people pointed out to me that with all the shooting and stabbing and killing of other people in my paintings, nothing ever happens to me. So I said, okay, I'll make a self-portrait and see how it feels. Totally harmless. That's my, uh, that's my uh, uh, conclusion. Uh, paintings are simply not painful unless they fall on you. But anyway, I'm, I'm doing myself in with a lot of different techniques there. Stabbing myself in the eye with a paintbrush, carving out my stomach with a chainsaw. Well, this is the imagination working, you know. I'm trying to fill a beer can, I think, though it's been a while since I've seen this painting, from a, a giant nipple. <laughs> okay. Who knows why these things are painted? Who knows why? I mean, actually, I have to admit, I, I haven't been to a shrink myself. I'm enjoying life too much. I, I don't want to spoil it. Since the 1960s, uh, Peter Saul has been creating a kind of ongoing portrait of America at its sort of deepest, darkest level. Um, at 85 years old, I think there's no sign of him stopping. And I think we all look forward to the kinds of paintings he's going to make as we try to reimagine what America is and can be at this really challenging moment in time.